Just, I'd, I'd love to tease out. I, I'm discerning a shift here towards a more realistic approach. And we stop and think, so, so, you know, across the political divide in this country, there is an awareness that we have to have unity in the face of the arc of autocracy. That's helpful. We're seeing big tech work constructively in relation to Russia, as we've been saying. As an illustration of how this has changed, and also of the power of the tech companies, it's worth remembering that uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the co-founder of Facebook, revealed on the Joe Rogan experience that shortly before the 2020 uh, presidential election, that the FBI directed Twitter and Facebook to suppress the story. This is pretty amazing about the potentially damaging contents of Hunter Biden's laptop computer. Uh, Twitter completely banned the New York Post story, uh, while Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg candidly admitted, made the story very hard to find on its platform. So you've seen, you know, th these are reflective of the concerns that I think a lot of people have had. Where do the loyalties of these companies lie? You're painting a picture now of a coming together in a more realistic attitude in relation to, to our democratic interests, our freedoms. That's encouraging for you, I take it? Uh, so two things. So the short answer is, is I do think over the course of time, we're moving in the right direction. I can give a couple of examples of, I'm not Pollyannish. I'm not just choosing to believe that. I, I think there are real trends that I observe mm. that cause me to believe that. Um, but let, let's take an example of why this is sometimes hard. Uh, I'll take your example of, of what Zuckerberg recently said about the New York Post article on, on Hunter Biden when he was on the, the Joe Rogan show. <clears throat> So I, you know, you and I currently are talking about kind of big hand wave mm. geopolitical yep. kind of currents. That's right. That of course is incredibly made more complicated um, by domestic politics. Of course, tech plays a huge part in that, and growing civil distrust of these companies make the type of cooperation that I'm advocating for more difficult. An example. So. Um, what, what Zuckerberg actually told Rogan was that um, during the 2020 election period, the FBI had come to Facebook and said, listen, we saw a lot of Russian disinformation and propaganda in the run-up to the 2016 election. We are anticipating more of that in this election. In fact, there's some intelligence that suggests that some might be coming soon. And the only instruction that the FBI gave Facebook was so be diligent. Um, now, to put in a moment, we'll unpack what that what that meant. But one thing that I have the privilege of knowing is, I was in the United States intelligence community when Facebook and these other social media companies kind of came into being, and I remember because I was a part of these conversations, the United States government was going to these companies, and the whole idea of content moderation came from our engagement with them where we said, you have terrorists on your platform mm -hmm. who are recruiting yep. and spreading propaganda and you need to cut that out. That I think falls well within a reasonable expectation of a government and industry engagement. But that's where content moderation comes from, is the government saying, we have a terrorism problem, they're leveraging your platform, help us fix that problem. Okay. Well. This is what the FBI and the government was doing uh, in, in the 2016 and 2020 election. We have a foreign propaganda and foreign influence problem. We're asking you to be diligent and to help us figure that out. And then we turned it over to them in terms of how they go about doing that because ultimately they're a private entity. The platform is theirs. They have a freedom of speech right under our constitutional system. And so the government did not dictate to them what they should and shouldn't do. They just said, we think you have a responsibility, please be careful. And that, that is illustrated by the fact that you had two different responses, one from Twitter and one from Facebook. Twitter decided, in the case of this um, uh, Hunter Biden story, that, okay, we're not gonna allow people to share it on our platform. Now they talked about having a, a, a policy about um, when people get doxxed or when their personal information is being shared without their permission, they shut that kind of stuff down. I think that's an arguable policy. Um, but regardless, they made a decision that we aren't going to allow our users to share this news story at all. 
Facebook chose a different path. And you have to understand Facebook has kind of two categories. There's what they call the news feed. That's what Facebook serves up to you based upon your user needs and experiences and preferences. So it's surfacing news and information that they think you'll like. The other side is, is how I engage with, with my followers. So if you and I followed each other on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook, but if, if we did, then there's what you and I do. So those are kind of two categories. What Facebook did with the Hunter Biden story is it, um, it, it constrained the spread of that story on the news feed. But you and I could share that with anybody we wanted to without any frustration or, or, or difficulty. So I could, example, go to the New York Post, copy a link to that article, post it on my feed so that everybody who's connected to me would see it, and then they could share it with whomever they liked. But what the, the news feed algorithm wasn't going to take that article and kind of pass it along the way it might some other stories. Regardless of how you feel about that or the goodness or badness of, of, of that choice, my point in drawing this all up is is that that's an example of an issue that's actually more complicated right. and nuanced than the way it's discussed. But because it's discussed in a simplistic and often in service of a political narrative one way or the other, for or against whoever you're identifying as the enemy, it complicates immensely this broader conversation of cooperation that I'm trying to have. Because if you believe that the tech titans are systematically and routinely trying to suppress freedom of speech, manipulate the American people, lie, cheat, and steal, well, you're not gonna be able to, you're not gonna feel a, a level of, um, certainly not gratitude, uh, and, and certainly not um, a, a, a benefit of the doubt that's gonna be required as we kind of figure out this cooperative process. So the problem itself is hard. On top of that, you have these companies who have, without a doubt, acted foolishly and arrogantly, who are, in, in many cases, trying to um, enforce a worldview that many Americans reject. Um, it, and, it, and it's difficult because in the past, if a company had a policy that you know, they were going to feel that one way or another about some social issue, that's kind of what they did in, within the, the four walls of their building and it didn't touch mm -hmm. anybody. But when Facebook makes a decision uh, about these things, it touches a couple billion people. And that's just new. And that's, that's, that's a, a peculiarity that we're wrestling through. So a listener would misunderstand me if they thought I was giving a pass to these companies, or if they believed I thought that they were somehow just misunderstood. I don't think that's the case. What I am saying, however, is that we have very large and important issues that we need to solve. And by talking about particularly domestic issues with these companies in simplistic and in frankly dishonest, even if it's un unintentionally so, ways, it makes that broader conversation much more difficult and much more slow. And uh, I don't think we can afford that. That's a very valuable set of insights and I thank you for them. My take out is we need to be very aware of these difficult issues being almost tailor-made for sensationalism at a time of enormous political polarization uh, and, and uh, vitriol uh, at the very thing that's so dangerous to us progressing together in the face of the real challenges now to democratic freedoms around the world. And that is not to minimize the, the social implications of all this stuff. And I think these are, I think these domestic issues are worth fighting about. I Absolutely. Mean, I mean, like, I don't think we should roll over. But your argument is not that you should fight over them. It's, it's how you fight over them and how you establish, if you like, integrity and decency and a willingness to, to negotiate in good faith. Right. What I'm saying is... is it's how you, you do it, not whether you do it. Exactly. If, if, if what I'm saying is, is if you only defeat a straw man, then you haven't actually won anything. Yeah.